Shams, Ambassador Sham Saran will be um, will be moderating the session. He's a career diplomat. He served in the Indian Foreign Service since 1970 and has been in several leading capitals of the world, including Beijing, Tokyo, and Geneva. He was India's ambassador to Myanmar, Indonesia, Nepal, and the High Commissioner to Mauritius. Thank you so much, sir, and over to you, and look forward to a great session. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, is this loud enough? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, friends, it is uh, a great uh, privilege for me to have the uh, task of introducing two excellent members of the diplomatic tribe uh, who are here this morning with us. Ambassador uh, Hussein Hakani, who until a few years back was uh, Pakistan's ambassador to the United States of America. Ambassador Hakani has uh, written this uh, magnificent book, which is about magnificent delusions. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, this may be about uh, India-Pakistan relations, but it is not. It is partly about India-Pakistan relations, but the delusions and I'm sure that there are many delusions between India and Pakistan, but this is about the delusions between Pakistan and the United States of America. And uh, although Ambassador Hakani has not yet appointed me as an agent for promoting his book, I would in fact uh, recommend that all of us here in India should actually read this book because it is absolutely fascinating and part of the reason why I found it fascinating was that while I was reading this book, I had to keep reminding myself that it was written by a Pakistani author, which is saying a great deal. So I would very much, uh, very much hope that uh, all of you will uh, have the opportunity to read this book. Uh, I have Ambassador um, Robert Blackman, who uh, had been for several years the US Ambassador in India. Um, one, of the, one of the major contributions that uh, Ambassador Blackwell made when he was ambassador to India, he described India-US relations flat as a chapati and then proceeded to make it like a phulka, but uh, unfortunately that phulka is somewhat diminishing these days. Uh, but I'm sure that Ambassador uh, Blackwell has a great deal to say, uh, not only about how the US relates to Pakistan, but also how uh, the, the United States uh, relates to India, uh, a relationship which is very much in the news, as you know, these, uh, these days. So first of all, let me start with uh, Ambassador uh, Hakani. Uh, Ambassador Hakani, uh, as I said, it is sometimes very difficult to really uh, understand how you came to write this uh, particular book. And, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of the relationship between uh, the U.S. and Pakistan, uh, which you uh, would certainly like to see different than what it has been for many years in the past, yet most Indians actually pay a lot of uh, compliments to Pakistan for having achieved something quite remarkable that over the last 50 years or so, not only did it have the United States as its ally, but it also had China as its ally and uh, successfully managed, as many Indians feel, to constrain India's own option. Uh, but reading your book, it would appear that this particular kind of equation that we are talking about has not really been to Pakistan's advantage. Why? Well, let me just, just begin by saying that I'm one of those who was born well after partition. So I was born a Pakistani. Um, I don't need a raison d'etre for why I'm a Pakistani. I did not need an explanation of what is my ideology to be a Pakistani. And then I see that Pakistan as a nation uh, has several problems that are uh, described around the world as a dysfunction of, that, of our country. And what are those? Um, compared to other neighboring countries, Pakistan has the lowest school enrollment rate. Only 58% of our school going age children go to school children between the age of 5 and 15. Enrollment, uh, with all its problems, in India is far higher, uh, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka. 
uh, exports constitute only 10% of Pakistan's GDP. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, which should be a guarantee of our security, but we sometimes behave like the man who keeps buying guns because he wants to protect his family, then stays up all night because he's afraid somebody will steal the guns, ends up having high blood pressure from staying up all night, and then has a heart attack because of the high blood pressure. <laughs> and so, so I thought after serving as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States that it was time to actually address some of the aspects of this dysfunction. And I traced part of the dysfunction to the US-Pakistan relationship. Why? Pakistan became an American ally soon after independence. Um, this had three consequences. Number one, because Pakistan thought it had American backing, it made Pakistan a little more belligerent towards India than it would otherwise have been. Pakistan and India would have been able to come to some kind of terms on their problems earlier if Pakistan's military did not have the assurance of having Patton tanks in the 1950s, um, uh, F-16s in the 1980s. Uh, the 1965 war would certainly not have happened because Pakistan did not have the equipment to fight that war and, uh, except for the equipment that it got from the US. Second, Pakistanis, like the Indians, cherished their independence. We did not want to become America's client state. But our leaders wanted America to be Pakistan's patron. So they did not want to be the client, but they wanted the Americans to be patrons, which of course was unrealistic, which is why there have been so many ups and downs in this relationship. The third consequence of the US-Pakistani uh, US alliance has been that Pakistan has ended up becoming far too dependent on the United States without looking inwards. And Pakistan's military has become the largest and the most powerful institution in the country instead of people's representatives. We've had three long military governments, uh, four in all, but three that have covered almost half of our country's history. And we have ended up ignoring all other aspects of progress and development. The, why, why do I call it a, a relationship based on delusions? Well, America never got what it wanted from Pakistan either. This was a relationship based on very narrow, short-term interests as perceived by respective bureaucracies. <laughs> and so, in the, uh, you know, the Americans thought they were going to have Pakistani troops to fight in Korea and Vietnam. Pakistan never gave a single soldier. Pakistan's military wanted all the equipment to come to it so that it could fight India, which America never wanted. And so in the end, everybody was doing what they thought was only useful at that moment, but it all had long-term consequences which have not worked to the advantage of any of us. <coughs> the only time Pakistan and the United States had a kind of a conversion of interest was in the war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And the consequences of that have not been very good for the world either. Al-Qaeda has become a nuisance for America, for Afghanistan, for the whole Muslim world, India, and the rest of the world. Okay. So that is why it has all been a magnificent delusion. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Hadani, you said that, uh, you know, this, for Pakistan this was a delusion because it did not really get what it should have got from this uh, relationship. In fact, it has become somewhat dysfunctional precisely because of this relationship. Uh, and the United States of America doesn't seem to have gained very much from this uh, either. But, Bob, you have said that one of the reasons why in 1971 the United States of America was supportive of what was then considered by the rest of the world a rather you know, brutal regime in Pakistan, uh, which led to the Bangladesh uh, war. Um, you, in fact, mentioned in uh, your own review, for example, of the blood telegram, that um, the relationship with Pakistan was extremely important because at least one important gain that U.S. made was it was able to get through Pakistan the opening to China, which was, from the geopolitical point of view, it was one of the most important things. Was the U.S. delusional about Pakistan? Uh, yes, is the broad uh, answer over the decades. Um, before I uh, respond directly, though, I want to reinforce what Sean said about this book. It is a remarkable book. It's uh, elegantly written, but much more important, it's uh, deeply researched, filled with archival material, and it has two major themes, uh, in my view. 
One theme is that over the decades, successive governments uh, of Pakistan lied systematically and comprehensively to the United States regarding especially its support for terrorism, its policies in Afghanistan, and its nuclear weapons program. And there are wonderful moments when one Pakistan leader, military leader, or another would put his arm on the President of the United States and say, I am an honorable man, I am a military man, I would never lie to you. <laughs> Lying through his teeth. Um, so uh, that's one thing. But the other, which maybe is even more striking, is that the Americans never digested this over time. That, uh, and one of the problems, of course, is we change our senior people so often that it's a story of a, a group of senior Americans, beginning with the president, uh, taking office, wanting to give Pakistan the benefit of the doubt, finding after a few years that Pakistan systematically lied to them, but then going out of office so that the next group of Americans could come in, give Pakistan the benefit of the doubt, and so forth. Uh, it is a, a, a striking story of American naivete and uh, the failure to learn over time. Now, uh, that does not mean that uh, the United States got no benefits from this relationship, uh, and uh, I do not include the querulous search to have Pakistanis fight in Vietnam, which is a rather odd idea in and of itself. But three, one Sham mentions. Uh, as you know, in 1971, Pakistan was the intermediary between the Nixon-Kissinger uh, administration uh, and the Chinese government facilitating the opening to China. And the Chinese uh, had made clear then and later that this was their preferred channel, that they weren't interested in other channels. Um, so uh, that was a major contribution of Pakistan to the United States. The second was also mentioned by Hussein, uh, the, uh, 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 the assistance of Pakistan during the Afghan war after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And the third was after 9-11 and the use of Pakistan territory as a forward base to uh, overthrow the Taliban after they refused to hand over Osama bin Laden. So, in all of those cases, those were major uh, resources in Pakistan for uh, the United States. I'd say one last point. If I sum up, I don't think Hussein put it exactly like this, but I would, um, and it has pertinence today. Uh, I think over these decades, the United States taught the leaders of Pakistan that it could lie to the United States without penalty. And it taught Pakistan that. Pakistan learned the lesson and implemented it. I, I would just say that, uh, two points, that learning the lesson, it was the wrong lesson to learn because again, it's a very short term advantage. Uh, you mentioned about the China thing. Uh, yes, it was Pakistan's major contribution to, to American out outreach to China, but eventually China wanted to talk to the Americans. So if, if, for example, President Nixon had taken a slightly stronger position on East Pakistan slash Bangladesh, that would not have really impaired the American-Chinese equation. It was just that Nixon really liked Pakistan and he disliked Indira Gandhi. He totally disliked Indira Gandhi and I have him, you know, verbatim in my book based on the tape recordings in the Oval Office, uh, language that I don't use in the presence of my daughters. Um, the, the other thing is that as far as the Afghan war is concerned, there too, the Americans could have done it more smartly. For example, instead of just sub subcontracting the entire jihad to ISI, out of fear that no American should cross the border into Afghanistan, so therefore it should all be done from Pakistani territory, 
uh, there were people in the embassy in Islamabad who were pointing out things that were being done by the Pakistani intelligence service at that time that were not acceptable to the Americans. But the Americans thought, you know what, it's more important for us to get along with the guys that we are dealing with. The, the, the career diplomats thought that. And so they preferred not to listen to bad messages or information that came in the way of making alternative decisions. And the same applied, by the way, when I was serving as ambassador. I mean, I tried to be a bridge. So I would tell my government what I thought was in best Pakistani interest while talking to the Americans and telling them this relationship needs to mature in a direction in which we don't base it on lies and deception and delusions, but we try and come clean and figure out a way of moving forward. Because once you've lied, and then you keep on lying to cover up the lie, you will never come to the moment of truth. And the only way you will come to the moment of truth is through some uh, very bad thing happening. And I don't think that that would have, be, would have been in the interest of the United States or Pakistan. My fear is that that moment will still come. Uh, Bob, you said uh, that all through these years, you had the Pakistani leaders lying and cheating and deceiving the United States. What happened to the phrase that, you know, you can lie to some of the people some of the time, uh, <laughs> but you can't lie to people all the time, all the people all the time, and this is what the U.S. used to have achieved right. over, the, over the years. Right. And uh, the other point I would like to make is, uh, my sense is not so much that the United States of America did not know that it was being deceived, but there were other you know, advantages, short-term advantages, uh, in terms of whatever your geopolitical, you know, uh, objectives may have been, where this would not really matter so much. Um, even with respect to uh, the opening to China, which I consider as a, as a diplomat, uh, a very remarkable initiative taken by the United States of America, changing the geopolitical balance in the world, and yet, it seems to be that you know, the price that was paid for that, an opening, is in a sense almost procedural. Uh, the price that was paid for it during the Bangladesh war was a very, very, you know, acute price, I would say, in terms of human uh, suffering. Um, and it would appear to me that uh, whether we are looking at the uh, Pakistan uh, of today, or we are looking at the United States of today, not much seems to have changed in respect of that very transactional relationship which has developed over the years. I think very, uh, both of them very good questions. On the first, uh, I would, uh, and Hussein admitted this earlier, uh, there's a classic diplomatic problem uh, which uh, you imply, Sean, uh, Sean, which is uh, when you want something out of another government, how much pressure can you put on it effectively in order to get what you want, and what price do you pay for exerting that pressure? And you can't find the answer to this in a cookbook someplace. Uh, in olden days, this was called statesmanship. Uh, and through this period, in addition to what I was saying earlier about uh, the delusional uh, aspect of this in Washington, there were things that we wanted out of Pakistan, and we didn't, of course, know exactly how much we could pressure Pakistan uh, before we ruptured the relationship and didn't get what we wanted from them. I wouldn't say for a moment that we always had the right balance, but uh, outsiders, I think, uh, folks who haven't been in this line of work, as we three have, often exaggerate how much uh, pressure one can effectively put on other governments. And that brings me to uh, 1971. Of course, we'll never know what an alternative policy would have produced. And although it's true that in 1971-72, China did wish to cultivate its relationship with the United States for the first time since uh, the revolution. But uh, I would point out, two years later, Cho and Lai was overthrown. And one can, I think, say today, well, it could have been done in another way as if 
it was an act of God. We will never know whether it could have been done in another way. What we do know is the way it was done produced an entente between the United States and China, a de facto uh, 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 meeting of the minds that has lasted in American policy to this day. And second, it led, I think, at least I would say, to the first strategic arms uh, agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union because of the concern about Chinese-American uh, collaboration. Uh, it led to, uh, in te this hasn't all been in the, uh, in the, in the media, but it, it led to very intense U.S.-Chinese anti-Soviet intelligence cooperation. And you could say it led to detente because it was the U.S.-China relationship which persuaded, we now know from Soviet archives, that persuaded Brezhnev and his successors. They had to reach a benign uh, accommodation with the United States and the Europeans. Now you could say, I'll finish, well all that would have happened anyway. But we will never know. And what I can say is it did happen by one set of judgments. We will never know whether another set of judgments could have produced an equally positive result. I myself am skeptical, and if I can analogize to today, the critics of uh, Nixon and Kissinger say, if you'd only pressured Yahya, he would have come around and stopped the genocide in, um, in uh, East Bengal. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's true, but I would just point out, think of an example when the United States has been able to change so fundamentally a country's internal policies by such external pressure, when the country in question thinks its very existence is at stake. And we've tried to do that in the last six months in Egypt, and how have we done? <laughs> the Egyptian military believes that country's integrity is at stake, and therefore our pressure to, for them to be more democratic in their practices has failed. I believe the same thing was true in 1971, but more pertinent, I think, the last one, I don't think much has changed in this delusional I, sense, Sean. I think, I, I, pros I, let me just finish, prospectively, we've been doing this for years, so it's fine. I, I, in fact, I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take this uh, argument for that. I, I think you, you have, what you have, uh, in fact, uh, uh, confirmed is that, uh, you know, sometimes there is collateral damage uh, what? to what may be uh, a very sensible policy uh, in terms of geopolitical calculations. Yeah. But there is no doubt that there has been a massive collateral damage right. on Pakistan. And taking that forward, Ambassador Hakani, I would like to ask you, this is about the future, this is about the present. Is Ambassador Hussein Hakani a one-off? Or are there other Hussein Haqqanis there as well? And are they going to be making a difference? Are they making a difference in, the, in Pakistan today? Is there a real realization that this, for example, the use of what you call non-state actors, this has really been something very destructive for Pakistan itself, whatever damage it may be doing to India or, or, or to Afghanistan. Do you believe that that kind of a critical mass of opinion is developing in Pakistan, which can give us some hope that things are really going to change? Before I answer your question, let me just say one thing on the U.S.-Pakistan uh, issue that we haven't brought India into that. I but <laughs> part, part of the reason, part of the reason why the U.S. kept turning to Pakistan was because of the way the Indians interacted with the United States. And I'll leave it at that so that you two can have another spat in a moment. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be really entertaining for the audience and myself. Uh, as far as Pakistan and where does Pakistan go? Look, first of all, I'm not that important a figure. I'm just somebody who has served my country as ambassador, uh, not necessarily been appreciated for it by my intelligence service and, and, and the military. Uh, but definitely appreciated by a lot of Pakistanis. But I'll just give you an example. Malala Yousafzai is 40 years younger than I am. 
and she's just a young girl from a small village in the Swat Valley. Instinctively, she hadn't read anything of mine. She hadn't, she doesn't, she's not a political animal, she's not a political person. She instinctively stood up to the Taliban and said, well, why should my school close down? And that kind of instinctive response to what I consider to be a obscurantist vision for Pakistan, I think that is the hope for Pakistan, that there will be enough people, women in particular, <laughs> women who will say, we don't want to be shunted away from the public space. Children who will say, why am I not going to school? Um, businessmen who will say, why is the policy so badly designed that we do not have the kind of economic uh, opportunities that other countries the same size as ourselves do? And other people who will say, what is this permanent insecurity with India? We now have nuclear weapons. Let us act as a proud nation that has nuclear weapons and feels comfortable. Why are we inherently insecure? There is no such thing as an eternal conflict. Nations have fought wars for years. Germany and France is an example. Both are in the European Union. So those are the directions that Pakistan could take. Now, I have to inject a word of caution. When there are voices like mine making that point, there is a lot of power that is being put against us by the so-called Pakistani establishment. Uh, they eliminated Benazir Bhutto, they couldn't handle Salman Tasir standing up for the religious minorities of Pakistan, uh, Balala Yousafzai is in exile or is abroad. That basically means that there is a powerful uh, interest in keeping the status quo in Pakistan as well. So what I would say is, don't lose hope, but don't be overly optimistic. Cautious optimism should be placed because a nation of 180 million cannot allow a bunch of uh, extremists lead our way. Malala Yousafzai could give us a future. Hafiz Saeed can only give us destruction. Thank you. Well, uh, as you said, we have spoken about the delusions on the U.S. side and the delusions on the Pakistani side. Let me ask you, as an Indian, what kind of delusions do the Indians have? No? Do we have delusions? <laughs> How, are you going to be too much of a diplomat to answer? <laughs> um, I, um, I feel much more <laughs> in this audience, uh, this extraordinary audience of Indians, you ask an American to talk about Indian delusions, uh, I'm not suicidal. Uh, so uh, uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll uh, skip that uh, opportunity. Um, I'd, rather, I'd rather talk about American, if we're going to talk about U.S.-India relations, uh, American uh, delusions is too strong a word, but uh, uh, misapprehensions. We have an unhappy history, and it's not just 1971. Just to vivify it, India was the only democracy uh, during the Cold War with which the United States didn't have close and friendly relations. The only one. That's pretty remarkable if you think of the extraordinary dynamism of Indian democracy, shared values, and so forth. And, of course, that changed uh, in, the, in the early years of the George W. Bush administration when there was a transformation. Um, uh, uh, Sham said earlier that perhaps some of the the air has gone out of the balloon, and I think that's right. Uh, and I think there are a variety of reasons for this, but uh, I don't think, curiously enough, Pakistan is one of them now. Uh, uh, and maybe that's a positive thing. By the way, uh, Hussein, of course, who uh, knows infinitely more about Pakistan than I do, is uh, cautiously optimistic about Pakistan's uh, future. I'm incautiously pessimistic about uh, Pakistan's future. Uh, I, I do not see the trends that make me uh, believe next year will be better in Pakistan than this year. In fact, I think next year will be worse, and I think the year after that will be worse because of the rising tide of, of uh, uh, extremism in Pakistan. So, uh, uh, an aside, but with the U.S.-India relationship, as with every diplomatic relationship, uh, one uh, builds over time, 
uh, uh, collaboration and trust, but we haven't been at this very long uh, in terms of the last uh, 70 years. Uh, and it's still fragile, the U.S.-India relationship, certainly in the short term. In the long term, our shared values, along with the rise of Chinese power, will make us very interested in hearing what the other one has to say and collaborating uh, over the long term. But in the short term, I still think there's a lot of work to do, including uh, by people like yourselves, because the interaction between ordinary Americans and ordinary Indians is one of the most important uh, foundations of this relationship. It's extremely po uh, popular in the United States, depending on the poll, the most popular country in the United States. So the ground, uh, the ground uh, uh, level of interaction is very important. So uh, uh, we would have said, 20 years ago that the principal impediment to U.S.-India collaboration was Pakistan. We would have said that 30 years ago. We would have said that 40 years ago. I think it is an achievement and a meeting of the minds between the Indian and American elites about Pakistan that that's no longer the case. But I would, I would conclude by saying I don't think either government knows how to deal with the Pakistan that is emerging. Uh, we talk about it certainly informally, but I think uh, neither one of us knows how to help shape the future of that country in ways that Hussein has uh, put his life on the line to advise. And uh, the more we talk about it, the better. Not at Pakistan's expense, but at a way to support those very uh, forces inside Pakistan that Hussein was uh, enumerating. Well, um, precisely the last point that you made, uh, despite the fact that uh, it would seem that uh, it is in the U.S. interest and it is in the Indian interest to really support those elements who wish to see a very different kind of Pakistan, uh, who would wish that uh, the kind of establishment that you are talking about, particularly uh, where the uh, army and the ISI seem to have a kind of a veto over how the relations with India are going to be pursued, how relations with the United States would be pursued. What do you do about Afghanistan, particularly 2014? Uh, and yet, one sees that uh, time and again, uh, the United States particularly, not so much India, but uh, prefers to deal precisely with those that establishment. I think um, that's changing, though. I, uh, I would certainly hope so. Uh, but I think uh, if we really wish to uh, promote uh, these elements, more positive elements in Pakistan, then I think one needs to be able to give credibility to that civilian uh, leadership. And I think that has been to some extent uh, lacking. Point uh, about uh, the changes that may be taking place in uh, Pakistan. Uh, let me just give you uh, what I see from the Indian side. Uh, while it seems as if our relations have not made that much progress, uh, if I look at where we started off from, say in 2004, at the time that I took over as Foreign Secretary, and I see the situation today despite all the somewhat terrible things which have happened, including Mumbai. Uh, it is remarkable how much, in fact, the relationship has progressed over these last 10 years. Ceasefire, despite, you know, time and again, there being disruptions, has generally helped. If you look at the cross-border traffic between the two countries, there's something like 10,000 people going back and forth across the, across the uh, borders uh, every month. Uh, if you just look at how many Pakistani performers, artists, authors, you know, come to India, sometimes even to, in to launch their books here, uh, it is quite remarkable how much, uh, how much change uh, has taken place. Uh, and with the United States as well, if I see the, the kind of uh, substance that has come about in India-US relations today compared to 2004, uh, it is remarkable. Much of this is happening perhaps not in the glare of uh, spotlights, but uh, actually quite a great deal is happening. So is it that we are 
maybe our expectations have been raised too much and we need to be a little, little perhaps. No, I don't uh, think it has to do with expectations. I mean, uh, Ambassador Blackwell was right in saying that he's not suicidal to talk about sort of, you know, uh, uh, Indian uh, errors in dealing with the United States in front of an Indian audience. And I'm not suicidal to be uh, <laughs> pessimistic about Pakistan in India so that everybody in Pakistan's media turns around and says, gosh, he badmouthed Pakistan while he was in India. Um, but on the, uh, I don't think it's about expectation. It's, uh, it's, about the, it's about the volume that really ought to be based on the uh, actual on-ground realities. Look, there are six million families in Pakistan six million families in Pakistan with cross-family links in India. Given that fact, 10,000 visitors is not something to right. write, ho write home about. But compared to zero or almost zero earlier, it is quite sure. a bit. So, so the whole question is that the India-Pakistan relationship, if you plotted a graph, the way it has worked is every few years we come down to zero. And then we become very happy when it goes a little bit up and then it comes down to zero, and then we are all happy. The fundamentals now need to be addressed. And the fundamentals are that we are essentially people who live on one subcontinent. We have 5,000 years of shared history and 66 years of partition. And it's time for us to actually move beyond the disputes that some of us think exist. 95%, it's a very interesting factoid, 95% of Pakistan's population today comprises people like me, people who were born after partition. We have no memory of partition. We do not need to go into that all the time. Pakistan does not need an ideology. Pakistan needs a functioning government. Pakistanis need uh, uh, jobs. Pakistani kids need education. And so Pakistan needs to become a functional state and India and the United States and everybody else need to think about how do we nudge Pakistan into becoming a functional state if, instead of an ideological state. What does an ideological state give Pakistan? It gives people like, and I'm going to cite Hafiz Saeed again, who stand on Pakistan Day in Lahore uh, and say that Pakistan cannot be complete without eliminating India. So 180 million people of Pakistan are going to be brought up with hatred of India forever and ever, something that they cannot accomplish, and in the process, destroy themselves. That is not a good vision for Pakistan. And whatever anybody can do to encourage an alternative vision for Pakistan that brings reform in Pakistan. Look, making Pakistan more insecure is not the solution. Because then these people say, oh God, we told you so, everybody's ganging up on us. What needs to be done is essentially focus on the Pakistani establishment and the jihadi nexus. And basically talk about a Pakistan that is not a safe haven for terrorist groups, whatever their stripes or, uh, or color or whatever their ideological persuasion. And on that, I think the US and India can work together and they can definitely apply the right kind of pressure to uh, decelerate this, uh, the, 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 the power and prowess of the jihadi establishment nexus and enable the other elements in Pakistan to assert themselves. The problem being that as long as this particular very powerful establishment that you are talking about uh, is still, uh, in a sense, uh, determining Pakistan's policies with respect to uh, India with respect to the United States and with respect to terrorism. Uh, as long as that particular elite still believes that this is the way of using, for example, cross-border terrorism as a kind of a uh, tool for state policy, uh, if it believes that that is still the best way to advance Pakistan's interests or to safeguard Pakistan's interests, uh, and Bob says, you know, um, even if Yaya was pressurized by uh, the United States, if there was a feeling that this was all about survival, this was all about, you know, very vital interest, uh, they would not listen to us. Uh, how do we, how do we... Something has changed and not enough people talk about it. What has changed is that Pakistan now has nuclear weapons. A nation with nuclear weapons 
breeding an entire generation and another, another, yet another generation on the idea of insecurity is absurd because nuclear weapons at best give you mutually assured destruction. So this assumption that somebody will come and destroy us without, uh, uh, with, with, uh, without a price, I think it's more psychological. It's not, don't try to be logical about it, it's psychological. It needs to be dealt with at a political level and I think that when Pakistani leaders or Pakistani members of the establishment come and give their usual talking points about why Pakistan feels insecure, it's time to call their bluff. Okay. It's time to say, you know what, this is nonsense. Pakistan is there, nobody's about to eliminate Pakistan. Your real problems are your school enrollment, your lack of exports, your lack of taxation, your inability uh, to, uh, uh, to maintain good relations among the various provinces of, of your people. Focus on that, please. Don't lecture us about unresolved disputes that okay. need to be resolved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, yes, please. <clears throat> yeah. Hello? Yeah. Short question, please. Yeah, no you comments. said uh, you have got 180 million people and 180 million people and they cannot feed on this hatred and everything. And at the same time, you have also prescribed a role for India and America to work together uh, to tell Pakistan what it was their bluff. But at the same time, is intent on the people and government of Pakistan primarily to see their economic development first? Because in India, we used to see everything through prism of Pakistan. What's happening there or what's happening here? Are we better off or are we not? Is Pakistan more aggressive or are we more aggressive? But as the economic development has taken place, we have stopped seeing, means quite a number of people now don't see anything through Pakistan or compare ourselves with Pakistan. It has gone with the economic development and the mentality. So what, is, what is your question? So is it not on you, Pakistan, primarily, to look on into that rather than seeing other but governments? But that is what we have said in this book. All yeah. right. uh, this is a question easily answered, yes. Yeah. Uh, could, we, uh, could we take a few questions and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, please. Maybe then. Uh, do you think uh, it is ever going to be uh, possible, like two Germanys, for us to come together? Okay. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, Belgium, India, and Pakistan again. Okay. Yes, please. I'll come to you. Uh, my question is, uh, all, all three of you sitting here, I just wanted a prognosis, since we've got the best ambassadors here, prognosis for Afghanistan. Can we have a solution there? Uh. Yes. Without Pakistan. Thank you. Okay. So we have a question about can India and Pakistan merge together. We have a question about, about Afghanistan. Uh, yes, please. And lady at the back. Okay. The question is about uh, nanny trouble. About? Nanny trouble. Nanny trouble? Yes. The, the recent nanny trouble. Oh, nanny trouble. Okay. Yes. Could Ambassador uh, Blackwell please address this? Why did this happen? Uh, given the improving relations. Okay, okay, yeah. no, no trouble. Uh, one more question before I come back to the panel. Yes, right at the back, please. Here. At the back, at the back. We are missing out people from the back. Really quickly, the ambassador's view on disarmament in South Asia for, against, possibility, not a possibility. Okay, disarmament in South Asia. India. Disarmament in South Asia. Uh, Would you like to address money? <laughs> He did say, would you like to address, and you could always answer that one with a no. Uh, uh, let me only say about three things. First of all, uh, I don't think uh, that this very troubling episode uh, has uh, reflected magisterial uh, diplomatic competence uh, in either government, if I may say that first. Second, um, operationally, um, I think uh, the Indian diplomat should never have been arrested. That's my second point. My third point, you may wish to hear the third point before you clap on the second. <laughs> my third point is that she uh, was uh, judged by our legal system to have committed a crime. 
and in our country, as in yours, you're innocent until proven guilty, so she was judged to have committed a crime. But of course, in our country, that usually means you go before uh, a jury. Uh, obviously, India would not wish its diplomat to go before such a jury. Uh, so, and I'm not, not, I'm not now doing the merits of the case of the criminal uh, assertion uh, by the United States, including by a grand jury, but I think uh, that uh, the uh, episode should have ended with the U.S. quietly saying to India, uh, there's trouble brewing here, and uh, we think that uh, a reassignment would be uh, a quiet reassignment, would be good for both countries. This is obviously not what happened, and uh, that's very, very regrettable, uh, and because it's a blow against the strategic interests of both countries. So that's, that's what I think. It's complex. One could go into many more details, but I will relieve your anxiety by not doing so. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that the uh, better future for Pakistan and the United uh, for Pakistan and India uh, would be the relationship between Canada and the United States. Uh, I think that uh, uh, talking about I mean this is this is no longer an East Germany West Germany situation. Uh, the last 66 years have changed a lot, um, and I think that uh, I think a, a more realistic view would be. A bit like Canada and the United States, where both are uh, the, uh, both both are sovereign countries, and yet they share much more uh, than they differ over. Uh, the welfare system being one of them. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so I would say that that is a better future. Uh, uh, two countries, neighbors, much more uh, uh, easy travel, uh, less hostile, uh, virtually no hostility. Occasionally, they have disputes over uh, soft lumber. Uh, and, and things like that, which are natural between nations. But I think that is the ideal uh, uh, that we should be talking about. And on Afghanistan, mm. on Afghanistan, I think that uh, we should be wary of the prospect of a renewed civil war in Afghanistan and of any country of the region getting in. Um, I know that you said, can there be a solution without Pakistan? That sometimes it reinforces the view on, in the Pakistani establishment that they can hold the world hostage over Afghanistan. And it's time for everybody else to say, you know what? You want a friendly government in Afghanistan. The way for you to have a friendly government in Afghanistan is to become friends with the government in Afghanistan instead of trying to impose a government of your choice in Afghanistan. And any effort to try and create civil war in Afghanistan by any country, any country in the region <coughs> should definitely uh, be resisted by the rest of the world. It will be better for Pakistan and it will be better for Afghanistan if Afghanistan has a, a peaceful transfer of power after President Karzai and in the, uh, after the new election and even after American withdrawal if the Afghan National Army is the force that protects Afghanistan rather than some bunch of madrasa kids going across the border and unleashing mayhem. Um, that is what Afghanistan should become like. Bob, what will, Pakistan, what will the Afghanistan be like 2014? Well, I endorse in every word of what Hussein just said. Uh, I also would like to be uh, rich and handsome, and that's about as likely as Pakistan adopting the policies that you are advising. Uh, I think Pakistan will, through its military and its intelligence agencies, continue to interfere with the future of Afghanistan as it has. It, ha it has a complex relationship with the jihadi groups in southeastern Afghanistan, but um, I think it will keep trying uh, to uh, uh, dominate the political choices made in Kabul, as it has done uh, uh, for uh, decades. Uh, and then the question of arises, well, what can India do about this and what can the United States do about it? And that in the American uh, case, I won't speak about the Indian uh, influence on the situation in the American case, that's closely tied to whether we keep forces there uh, after this calendar year that can influence uh, the battlefield. And uh, I don't know the answer to that. The trend lines do not look good in the U.S. in that respect. 
The American people have turned completely against this war. Uh, they have forgotten why it started. Uh, Americans are not famous for their mem historical memories, even 10 years ago. Uh, so I don't know what the outcome will be, but if we have a total troop withdrawal from Afghanistan at the end of this year, or something close to it, I think it's an open invitation to ISI and to the jihadis, uh, the Taliban and their associates to resume what they wish, which is to first take Kandahar uh, and southeastern uh, Afghanistan and then to proceed north and west uh, to Kabul and we'll see how far beyond. So this is a crucial intersection uh, for the future of Afghanistan. And I want to I, I conclude by uh, just making clear my own view. Hussein says, absolutely right, there's no country that should be allowed to try to dominate ex from ex externally the future of Afghanistan. There's only one country that's trying to do that. So let's don't say as if, well, there are four or five candidates. There's only one candidate, and that's Pakistan. And, and that's I, why you and I make such a good team. You end up saying what I want to say but cannot. And I end up saying things that you would like said but not in the same words. So we work, yeah. we, we work fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yes, yes. We, whether we make the point. Yeah, well, we're thinking of, of developing a nightclub act in which, we, in which we go around India doing this. So I think that... Uh, Afghanistan is, is uh, obviously at a real intersection for a variety of reasons, and I think if you look at it, one must be extremely worried about its future, extremely worried about its future, uh, and with the likelihood uh, of uh, Pakistan continuing its policies, the Americans more or less leaving, which I think do not support, but that's beside the point, and Indian interests being deeply engaged in, in the future of Afghanistan. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps what worries uh, Indian policymakers most is that uh, even the kind of relative improvement of relations that have come about between India and Pakistan uh, may, in fact, uh, fall by the wayside if the predictions that uh, Ambassador Blackwell is making in fact uh, come to pass. Uh, I have uh, uh, just time for maybe two or three questions before we conclude. The lady there. I want to address my question to Mr. Robert Blackwell. You talked about Yahya Khan and you talked about how there wasn't much uh, capability that the Americans had over applying pressure and we don't really know what, the, what would have happened had they not applied pressure. Well, it wasn't even about pressure at that time. Uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger were clearly ambivalent about the situation. They did not, they knew that the genocide was taking place. I mean, the blood telegram, the book that you referenced, Gary Bass clearly says that these invoices were coming towards to the White House, but they kept on ignoring them. They supported the Yahya Khan government. It wasn't, they weren't ignorant about it. So can you please address the situation? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, much of that has already been uh, addressed. Uh, I, I, I think that we will need probably another session uh, to go further into, uh, you know, what the Black Telegram uh, is all about. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Thanks. Is it a magnificent delusion to think that, is, there, is it a magnificent delusion to think there could ever be peace between India and Pakistan without China agreeing, and also a delusion to think that China would ever agree. And if, by some chance, India and Pakistan ran into that problem, would, the Amer would America be able, be willing to put pressure on China and exert that pressure to pull, push through some deal? Okay, one more question and then we are done. Please. Yes. I have a question for both the ambassadors regarding people-to-people -people perception. There are three ambassadors here. I'm sorry. Uh, two ambassadors who aren't moderating. Um, there are people, a dozen up here. People-to-people <laughs> uh, -people, uh, relations and perceptions between your respective countries and India. Ambassador Hakani mentioned Hafiz Saeed. 
But when I visited Pakistan, I've also seen, apart from a generation raised on hate, a generation which actually has a lot of um, interest and um, delivers a lot of warmth and love towards India. So I've seen that. And in America, where I've lived for a few years, there's also, I mean, what I found more than anything is complete incomprehension, or they just don't know what India is. Hence, I was quite surprised when the ambassador said India was very popular in the US. And especially if you read the New York Times over the last five years, um, it's more, it's, uh, India, I think, gets dismissed quite a bit. So I was quite okay. surprised. Okay. Uh, I think most Indians find Indians also incomprehensible. But uh, 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 there was a question about you know China's uh, role, which I think is 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 interesting. Uh, I would say, as far as India and Pakistan are concerned, uh, it is really if India and Pakistan decide to be to live in peace, I doubt whether China would have much much to say about uh, that, even if it wishes to. But uh, Bob, would you like to well, answer some of John, that? If I understand, the question is, uh, could uh, the United States exert sufficient pressure on Beijing to change its policy on Pakistan, which I take it is strategically directed at diverting India from a broader geo-economic, geo-political uh, role in the world by becoming a rising great power, by keeping India focused on the problems with Pakistan. And I would answer it like this. Uh, I'm struck in lots of the questions where uh, there is an infatuation with the instrument of American pressure <laughs> as a uh, frequent uh, diplomatic occurrence. Um, I'm not sure I can think of a lot of examples in recent years where that actually has been shown to be true, uh, but I'll still uh, pursue this. I don't think, given what's at stake in the U.S.-China relationship, that China's policy toward Pakistan is ever going to be very high up the list uh, in U.S.-China relations, except the nuclear relationship between China and uh, Pakistan. And I'll give you, uh, if you think, maybe I'll end like this, because we are at the end. What's remarkable to me, as a historian, I'm a diplomatic historian when I'm not uh, pontificating on policy. And what's remarkable to me is of the transgressions that Hussein describes in his book about Pakistan, perhaps the most egregious given American national interest was the AQ Khan nuclear network of transferring nuclear technology. And Pakistan paid no price for that. And that's really quite remarkable uh, and I think uh, exemplary of our problems with Pakistan. I don't think myself that either India or the United States is going to have very much influence on the future of uh, Pakistan. The future of Pakistan is in the hands of the Pakistani people. And I conclude by saying the, uh, the questioner who wanted to talk about the blood telegram, I'm happy to do so uh, after uh, the session, but I've written a 5,000 word review, uh, which I will give you the website and you can find it in the Council on Foreign Relations, which contests most of the scholarship in that particular book. Any last words? Very, very last I words. I think the young man here who said that, you know, when, when Indians go to Pakistan, they are very well received, uh, he is not wrong. Uh, because, the, as I said, 5,000 uh, 5, years of shared history. Uh, there's a lot uh, that, that brings us together. So I'm sure that you uh, encountered those people who want that history to be revived in terms of closer relations ties. But that should not blind you to political realities. Uh, and the influence of pernicious elements like those represented by Zaid Hamid and Hafiz Saeed. And even though I am not a representative of the United States, let me just say, reading the New York Times should not blind you to how Americans actually <laughs> feel towards India, because the, uh, you know, they're, they're talking only about their, their reporting. It's, it's a selected thing that they report on. But constant polling data shows that when Americans are asked, what are the countries you like and what are the countries you dislike, uh, India is usually on the top of the 
most liked countries. Unfortunately, amongst the least liked countries in the United States are North Korea, Iran, and Pakistan. Something that I remind Pakistanis all the time, that they always talk about anti-Americanism in Pakistan. There is now a rising anti-Pakistanism in America that my countrymen should become aware of and should be wary of. Okay, on that note, let's end this session. It remains for me to thank Ambassador Blackwell and Ambassador Hagani for this very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Well done, John. Well done. Thank you very much. Hussein Hakni, Robert Blackwell, and Sham Saran for this very interesting and very entertaining session about magnific magnificent delusions. Um, we will have a break of 45 minutes now and continue at 2.15 with our program. The next session will be on Basha and Paribasha.